Good morning. I'm Art Kellerman. I'm Dean of America's Medical School at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. I've been a federal official for all of two and a half years, and I've learned that this is the most important slide. <clears throat> Nothing that I'm about to say uh, is necessarily represents my university, the Department of Defense, the U.S. government, my wife, my wife's cat, my relatives, or anyone else. <laughs> These are my opinions only. Second, in the spirit of disclosure, along with Brian McNally, I co-founded the CARES Registry and served on its advisory board until 2013 when I entered the federal government. I have no former relationship with CARES to date. I'm also co-inventor of a hands-only CPR training mannequin that was invented actually several years before we realized that hands-only CPR was necessarily a good idea, as well as a device to prevent inadvertent hyperventilation. Neither of these is going anywhere commercially, haven't made a dime off of them. Uh, they are not in any kind of FDA approval process, but uh, I do hold patents um, through Emory University. Other than that, I have no conflicts to disclose. The book that we're here talking about, the consensus report on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, was the last publication of the Institute of Medicine before it became the National Academy of Medicine. And for many years, the IOM consensus reports, including this one, included a quote from Goethe in the front of every book. And if you go outside and pick up a copy, you'll see it. It says, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. Let's look at this saying in the context of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. What do we know? Not what needs to be found out, but what are the basic core understandings that I think we all share today? I would point back to a paper I commented on briefly yesterday by Camille and Sassa and colleagues. It was a meta-analysis of 79 studies published up to roughly 2010. Over 142,000 patients who are victims of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, primarily in this case, adults. First, we knew and we know that a victim is more likely to survive if the collapse is witnessed by a bystander EMS. It's kind of a no-brainer. Second, if they get bystander CPR, it roughly doubles or triples a victim's odds of survival. Third, if the first rhythm identified when a defibrillator is applied is shockable, they have a substantially greater odds of survival than not. And very importantly is return of spontaneous circulation, a pulse reestablished on the scene. The odds ratio for getting out of the hospital alive is roughly 37 compared to refractory cardiac arrest brought into an emergency department with ongoing CPR. There's not a lot of rocket science in this. What this tells us is that we want to optimize rates of bystander CPR, we want to get a defibrillator to the side of the patient as quickly as possible, and we want to do everything we can to resuscitate that patient on the scene prior to transporting to the hospital. We are still not very good at bringing the dead back to life. Well, how well have we applied this knowledge? Given that we have been working on this, some of us in this room, for nearly 40 years, well, in this same paper, Sasson noted that between 1980 and 2010, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survival across the board was stuck at about 7.5 to 8.5 percent, all rhythms. That's a little higher number than the one that Dr. Alfterheide cited at the start of yesterday. But let that sink in for a moment. We've done an enormous amount of work. We have learned an enormous about. And yet, as a nation, we are not batting much better today than in 1980. That's not a failure of knowledge, that's a failure of action. Why? Because we know we can do better. There's huge city by city variability in the outcome rates of cardiac arrest, and there has been since I was a medical student at Emory in the 1970s. This is data from the CARES registry. Um, it shows that in cities participating for multiple years in this study, the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survival rates range from light, slightly more than 5% to well over 50%. That's a tenfold difference. That's not genetics. That's not city-by-city -city variability in comorbidity. That's not one place eats too much fat or has a little more hypertension than another. That tells us that in some cities, pre-hospital care is being delivered in an efficient and optimal manner, 
and in other cities it's not. And this data came from this registry that was created with the support of the CDC about a decade ago and today has over 17 states, a number of large communities, and as of yesterday, according to Dr. McNally, 100 million Americans are in a community served by the CARES registry at a cost of less than a million dollars a year, about a penny per patient. In my book, that's pretty cost effective. And it gets outcome data, it measures critical parameters of performance, and it helps systems and communities know how well they're doing compared to peers that are otherwise similar to them. And very excitingly, we now know that when cities participate in this registry, they get better. Is this the Hawthorne effect? Probably. Do you have a problem with that? I don't. It simply says when we measure what we do, we improve. When we know how we stack up compared to others, we raise our game. And I think every community in the country ought to participate in some keep it simple, stupid, straightforward approach, a registry that would allow them to benchmark their performance and focus on key measures organized around the chain of survival. Many of you, like me, grew up in an era of the ABCs of cardiac arrest, airway, breathing, circulation. Easy to remember, very easy to apply. We now know physiologically probably wasn't the optimal sequence of events. Circulation, early compressions is a lot more important. So I would recommend that we not scrap ABCs, but simply give them a new definition. A should stand for accountability. Every community ought to participate in a cardiac arrest registry. B should stand for bystander CPR. Every community should have a bystander CPR rate, not of 15 or 20 percent, but of 60, 70, 80 percent. And C, we should all adopt cardiocerebral resuscitation, an optimum approach by advanced life support personnel that minimizes unnecessary ventilations and maximizes compression density and the odds of survival. So how do we increase CPR? We know, as Drew said, dispatcher-assisted or telephone CPR works. Video self-instruction, thanks to Braslow and Brennan and others, we know that individuals can teach themselves CPR better than a four-hour sponsored course. And as you heard yesterday, we can even today get people to do pretty decent CPR with their cell phones, either self-teach while they're sitting on Metro, waiting with single tracking, or even turning on a cell phone that talks to them during a cardiac arrest and helps walk them through what to do. And finally, I would defer to Dr. Bobro and colleagues in Arizona that showed that minimal interruption of cardiac resuscitation makes a difference. And here's an area of science where I think we need to know more. Uh, I think back in my career, the number of times that I'm sure that my team and I ventilated a patient 25, 30, 35 times a minute. Not because we wanted to, you're just pumped. And every time that AMBU bag reinflates, your, body, your, your inclination is to squeeze it again. And how many times I paused to look at the monitor and try to figure out what that rhythm is while the patient was lying there getting no compressions. I didn't help any of those people. We know we can do better. So my appeal to you is keep it simple, keep it stupid, get it done. We know we must apply. We are willing. Let's do it.